morning, everybody. Today is a very, very special day because the temperature has finally dropped a little bit. If you woke up in these mountains this morning, you are blessed beyond. I couldn't believe it. I was going to wear sandals and my toes were cold, so I wore shoes. So that means officially we had some cool temperatures. That is so amazing. I love it. Now, don't get used to it, though, because they're telling us by Thursday it's going to be 98 degrees again. So just enjoy what we can while we can. That means today you should get out. As soon as we go off the air, you get ready and you go take a daycation up in the mountains. You can go up to Blue Ridge. You can go over to Turtle Town. You can go up to Morganton. You can go and sit by Lake Blue Ridge and just stare at the mountains and the water. Or you can venture out a little further and go up to the Nantahala. Today would be a perfect day to do that. So take advantage of this beautiful gift from God. Every single day is a gift from God. And every day we get good news somewhere. And the good news is Shelly, who was burned tragically in the fire when the house exploded, has been able to talk now. That is such good news, guys. She is going to be in the hospital for five months. And if you want to keep up with her progress and what's going on, Annie's uh, Restaurant Facebook keeps up with it daily, and they will share the information. It's just so exciting that she was able to talk. This lady was literally blown out of her house and landed in the yard. Now y'all think about that. Do you believe in miracles? Do you believe in God? How can you not? How can you not believe? This is an absolute miracle. She is speaking now. She is going to be in the Grady Burn unit for about five months. So for five months and continuing, we need to all pray for Shelly that she makes an amazing recovery. 50 to 60 percent of her body was burned. She literally blew out of her house. Now, if you don't believe in God, that'll wake you up. That will wake you up. And speaking of being woken up, there are a lot of revivals that have been going on lately and been a lot of good news about people being saved. And in today's world, you better get ready. We don't know what we're going to be facing, but I want to ask you to pray for some folks this is absolutely crazy. Um, Colorado is a very, very liberal state, but even Colorado does not deserve what's happening there. They vote very liberal. They allow very liberal things to happen, but they didn't allow what's happening now in Colorado. A Venezuelan gang who came across the border illegally as the border was open has now invaded a city there, and they have taken over an apartment complex where they have been robbing, beating, stealing, doing anything they can, and literally taking over like they did the streets of Venezuela. So if you think that that open border doesn't affect you, you know, Colorado's not on the border. Colorado's up in the middle of the U.S. They have been affected. So when you think, hmm, not sure how I'm going to vote, you might think a little harder because the border being open is going to change all our lives. And um, I feel very, very worried about this is just the beginning of what's happening with these gangs and these, um, you know, you get together, you get together five men that are mean and angry and, and have been taken out of prisons and then you put 10 more with them and then you put 10 more with them and we end up with violence in our country and that's something that we did not welcome in. But the open border did welcome them in, and we have them now to the tune of about 10 to 20 million. They haven't even been able to determine the number. But when I saw this this morning, I was almost sick at my stomach because I thought Colorado is such a beautiful, beautiful place. And for a whole complex of people to now be terrorized by this gang that has taken over. So pray for Colorado and pray that they come back to... Uh, back to maybe a godly life. You know, we think about that. Somebody asked me last night, they said, how did we lose our rights for these things that we lost our rights to? And I said, because we didn't stand up for what we believe in. And I think that today is a day that we all should stand up for what we believe in. I chose something today that I want to share with y'all. And uh, 
It's a very special man who did things that were against the law when he was young, and uh, he ran moonshine. He ran moonshine for quite a few years, and then he turned his life around. And so no matter what you're thinking today, you can really look at life and you can change the way you feel and you can look at life differently tomorrow. So that's what happened with Jerry Rushing and uh, he wasn't doing anything mean and evil. He was just doing something illegal because that's how he was making money. And later in his life, he turned his life around and he brought a lot of people to know the Lord. And I think that's what we should all look at as an example for us. And today I want to read something. But first I want to show some photos of a little boy who he's a he was a little boy now he's 15 today Caden is 15 this is my dear friend Evelyn's child he is the cutest kid and um, has always loved puppies and loves babies and loves he's, he's just a, a, a warm heart and uh, he is turning 15 now it's hard to believe looking at these pictures that the kid is now 15 years old he'll be driving soon poor Evelyn oh poor Evelyn but uh, he loves babies, he loves dogs, he loves puppies. He's, he's, just, he's just a warm heart. And so happy, happy birthday, Caden. I hope that you have a wonderful day. Evelyn has always adopted animals and, and has helped foster animals. And there's Caden, and he, he got himself a perm. <laughs> so there you go. Happy, happy birthday, buddy. Hope you have a great, great day. Well, we're going to share a picture of a mountain with you because I found something in Mike's book, and y'all know how I love this book. It's God Keeps Showing Up. And I want to read something because um, I've had a lot to think about over the weekend, and I've thought seriously about a lot of things. And I'm thinking, how can I make a difference in somebody's life? So I want to read something to you. And this is called Count the Cost. And this, again, is in Mike Smith's book, God Keeps Showing Up. I've always loved sports. I had a passion for them while I was in high school and college. All the coaches that I had pushed me and my teammates to make us better. They made it hard for, for a reason. Now think about that, that statement. They made it hard for a reason. Without resistance, you can't build strength. And, you know, we think about that all the time. Every athletic champion will tell you that excellence comes out of discipline and all training centers on resistance. Without obstacles, we cannot build strength, whether in the physical or the spiritual realm. Whatever costs nothing is worthless, but whatever is worthless costs a great deal. Jesus talked a great deal about counting the cost. He told us things that happen in our lives will have consequences from the actions we take. We should count the cost before making your decision, Jesus said. If you don't carry your own cross, and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. You cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Salvation is free because Jesus paid the cost for our sins in the shedding of his blood. But to be a disciple of Christ, we must totally surrender ourselves to him. We carry our own cross, putting to death our desires and living for Christ each day. To totally follow Christ is now not easy. Jesus told us it would be hard, but the obstacles we face in life help us grow stronger, just like in sports. We get knocked down, but we get back up. Our strength is in Christ. Whatever is wor worthwhile costs a great deal. It was for Jesus, and it is for all of us as well. When we look back on the things that have happened in the um, in the months leading up to the election, there's so much going on. You know, I was fortunate enough, or um, I, I guess it was fortune, I, I was at Martin Luther King's funeral, and I stood there, and I was very few feet from Robert Kennedy, only two months before he was murdered and assassinated. There were people who were at rallies standing very close to President Trump, just before he took a bullet and was almost assassinated. Is that good fortune? Or is that something that is there to teach us a lesson? I can remember the day, the moment, the hour that I stood in the crowd at Martin Luther King's funeral and everybody was together. Everybody was singing together. Everybody was joining together. Everybody was holding hands together. We were together as a nation. 
And I think Friday we witnessed America coming back together as a nation when we saw the Kennedy family and um, Robert Kennedy, part of his family supports him for joining the team that is going to save America. The other part of his family was very angry and I said, that's our right in America. That is still our right. We are so blessed that we still have rights. But if we don't get together and we don't work hard, our rights will be taken away. The cost for Jesus was very, very high. The cost for America has been very, very high. When we think about the lives that were lost, when we think about the lives that were aborted, when we think about the um, victims, as we gave up our right to have the Ten Commandments posted in schools and to have prayer in schools and to do the things that we had done all our life that we knew was right, we allowed somebody to take that from us. And I think now the cost is very, very high for America and very, very, it is very, very worth it. So today I want you to write yourself a note and say, write myself a check for $500,000 to America. Is everything I can do worth $500,000 to America? Is every moment of your life worth saving America? Certainly it is. We've got to save America. You don't have to, phys you don't have to really give $500,000, but you, if you think, if I write a check out for $500,000 and I just lay it there on my dresser every day and I look at it and I think I would give that much to save my country, it gives you something to work on. You don't have to deposit it, you don't have to spend it, but you need to think about it. And you need to think that each and every one of us, if we gather together, we can make a difference. And um, I was reading something somebody gave me the other day and I, and I thought about these things and it says, promises made, promises kept. Supreme Court Justice um, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh were appointed. Very conservative judges. Um, people buying American, ending the war on coal. There are so many things that happened in my lifetime that should have happened long before, but it took a strong president with strong resilience, and we saw that president in office for four years. And now we've seen the, we have reaped the disaster of the next presidency. And uh, today I was looking at gas prices, and I thought, wow, yeah, I remember the day I filled up at $1.68.9, and I was so excited, and today it's two ninety four. It's been 349. We never know what it's going to be, but it isn't getting any cheaper. I always buy lettuce. Every week I buy lettuce. Sometimes I end up throwing half of it away because it goes bad. But the lettuce was 89 cents a head. Today, today that lettuce was 349. Now they're telling us our grocery prices are up 10%, 20%, 24%. No, do the math, people. 89 cents a head to 349, are you kidding me? That's like four times as much money. So when you think about where are we going in America, Mike said it best, count the cost. Count the cost of your everyday living. Count the cost of what you've given up. Count the cost. I, I worry about Mike's LJ restaurant all the time. I owned a restaurant and yesterday I wore my Sherry's Iron Skillet shirt. And I thought about it all day long and I thought about, I used to offer a meat and three vegetables and your tea was included in it for three eighty-five. dollars Now think about that. Over at Mike's, they're paying that much for a chicken breast to then fry it and serve it up to you. They're paying ridiculous prices. I don't know how they're even open because I go to the grocery store. The reality is we all go to the grocery store. But today, I want you to sit back and I want you to think about our country and is the cost, is the price too high to join together and save our nation? No, it's not. There's no price too high to save America. And I think that we can work together and make that happen. So today, we're gonna visit with a couple of guys, the first one being Jerry Rushing. He grew up in the hard times. He grew up when, um, you know, you had to make moonshine, you had to raise a garden, you had to kill your own hog. There wasn't a whole lot of money going around. But he grew up hard and he grew up with a respect for our country. And then he built this amazing place where people would go and hunt and just get closer to the Lord and just spend time together. And he did that the last years of his life. Well, sadly, he, he is no longer with us, but he's with Jesus, so it doesn't get any better than that. So we're gonna take you to 
the original Duke of Hazard. If you've ever watched the Dukes of Hazard and you know who Uncle Jesse was, well, the program was done in honor and in, in memory of his life story. And so you're going to get to meet Jerry Rushing. I hope that you will take a little bit from this and you will understand that no matter where you are in life, there's somewhere better to go. And he started as a moonshiner and he ended up saving lives every single day. Here we go. Whether you're in the mood for chicken strips, a delicious burger, our classic banana split, or an upside down thick blizzard treat, we've got you covered. Hot and fresh food every day, every time. And delicious DQ soft serve make the perfect pair at your favorite place. Not fast food, fan food fast. Your Blue Ridge, Ella Day, and Jasper Dairy Queens are your meet, eat, and treat headquarters. Thank you for choosing DQ, how may I serve you? First down. There he goes up the middle. He'll be cut down at the 20. He's into the end zone for a fan and rebel score. Catches it in stride. He'll go to the end zone. Breaks the tackle. Touchdown. Whether you're swimming in the sea or splashing in the pool, making a masterpiece or just making memories, writing a great American novel or writing your term paper that's due tomorrow, whatever you do in life, Farmers is here to protect it. For all your insurance needs, call Donald Curtis in Blue Ridge.
is five miles from downtown Mount Airy, North Carolina, where you can visit the Andy Griffin Museum and also the Andy Griffin Playhouse. Now today, I wasn't crazy about downtown because 250,000 people have invaded downtown area for a fall festival. It is wild and crazy, so I definitely suggest a weekend when it is not quite so crowded. But take a trip. It's about six hours from our area, and it is a beautiful, beautiful drive. Come out and get to know the nice folks at the Mayberry Campground. Full hookup, everything you need. All you do is pull in, undo, hit, hook up your electricity, put your jacks down, and you are ready to go. Remember, this is only five miles from downtown Mount Airy, which is where Mayberry got its start. And uh, you'll remember, Andy Griffin's now 50 years in the works on television. Make plans to take a trip to Mount Airy, North Carolina. Welcome to Taylorsville, North Carolina, way, way, way back in the woods in Taylorsville, North Carolina. And I have to say, the drive in here was incredible. It was absolutely gorgeous. So many old houses, and I'm looking to this side of the road, looking to that side of the road, and I'm trying to take it all in, and I'm thinking, wow, I'd love to spend a whole day up here. The area is absolutely gorgeous, but we had a mission. The mission was to come to spend some time with Jerry Rushing. If you love the Dukes of Hazard like I did, and everybody knows my nickname used to be Boss Hog because I'm a get her done <laughs> kind of girl. And um, love, love, love that television program. So many people grew up watching Dukes of Hazard. Now, not everybody knows that the Dukes of Hazard was generally based on a young man's life and a young man's story. And the young man might be Jerry Rushing. Uh, just a little older now. Just a little older. <laughs> yeah. Now, do you want me to interview Sadie first or interview you? Well, either one. She's Sadie, most important. What now. you got going on, little girl? What you got going on? Huh? So I spend my time just looking after my daddy. Uh huh. Now, is daddy a good boy? And do you get a little snack here or there? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. We go out to lunch. Me and the boys from the hunts are over. You know, we go out to lunch and we go usually go up to Porky's and. And if you go up there, she's sitting in the car and wait. When you come out, you better have a takeout. <laughs> you if better you don't, have she won't look at you for two days. She'll um, sell up, won't look at you, she gets mad. I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. Now, Jerry, let's talk a little bit about, number one, we're in a wonderful hunting lodge. Now, is this kind of retirement for you? And yeah, it's something I just play around with. Uh -huh. I always enjoyed hunting and I don't do much hunting anymore myself, but I like taking people out. And mm -hmm. They like to go run them wild hogs. The woods around here, this is absolutely gorgeous. That's right, pretty little mountains. And beautiful, beautiful. Good spring water. Have you spent your life here? No, I originally was born in Monroe, and then I moved up here in the 80s uh -huh. after we got the Dukes of Hazard underway. Right. Now let's talk a little bit about the Dukes of Hazard. When that started... Not many people had family members in my family, a lot of moonshiners in our family. And so we knew the history of what happened. And most people made shine to support their families and to feed their families, not yeah. to get rich and famous. Yeah, uh, my daddy made some whiskey, my grandpa, and about all of his brothers made some whiskey. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a family trade, and uh, I was about the last one, you know, to right. come along and... As I say, push a good stick too far. <laughs> right, right. Now let's talk a little bit about driving these hills. Oh, yeah. Because the hills of North Carolina are a lot like the hills of Georgia. A lot of race car drivers came out of these hills mm -hmm. based on a little bit of shine in some of their families, too. Yeah, Junior Johnson and, uh, uh, well, the Petties, you know, they right. used to run shine. Right. Old Wendell Scott, he ran a lot of whiskey. Uh -huh. And uh, most of the old race car drivers, really were moonshiners that had the talent to drive and right. I was driving a car when I was 12 year old. This daddy'd send me out with a load and I was just a kid, you know, but I could run, outrun about any of them, you know. I was always was a pretty expert driver and then when I got a little older, about 15, I started racing and uh, 
I drove about 12 years mm -hmm. to run some with uh, the Petties and the old Dale Jarrett Steady and uh, Pearson and Yarbrough and some of them back in the old right, days. Right, back when racing was racing. Yeah, Bob Isaac and a whole bunch of them old ones. Wow. Fireball and Speedy now, Thompson. Now, you said a magic word, Junior Johnson. He, he <laughs> was like the granddaddy of racing. Yeah. So much respect for that man. So yep. much respect for him. I did a couple of films with him for one I think they're using at the uh, new museum mm -hmm. and we did something for the History Channel a time or two and uh, then we interviewed Junior you know on that band we're working on and right. I see him every once in a while. Right. I used to see him a lot more often than other days. <laughs> now as, as, a, as, a, as a moonshiner did you ever think about your life story being on television and in film? Never crossed my mind. Mm -mm. How did all this happen? Uh, I wrote a song called Mama Had to Pay. One day I got to thinking about all this stuff, and I thought, well, you know, it's we are the one that goes to jail. Right. And we think, well, poor me, you know. Mm -hmm. but it, you're not the one that has to pay. It's your mother who sat out on the doorsteps till 2 o'clock in the morning to hear your car coming back. Right. And when you was out racing, she'd be sitting on the doorsteps when you come in at night. We didn't think nothing about that. I got to think, well, she has to pay. And so I, I wrote a song about it. And this guy heard it. And he said, uh, well, John Swears, who writes for Charlie Pride and uh, Ronnie Millsap, mm -hmm. he wrote a uh, song, The Girl Waits on Tables. He went on one right. of my hunts one time. And he uh, went back and wrote that song because my wife waited on us at a seafood restaurant. And he wrote The uh, Girl Waits on Table and sent her a copy before uh, recording. He wrote Amazing Love sitting on one of my stands out hunting. Wow. But uh, they told me to take it to somebody, and I asked him about working with it. And he said, Jerry, I'll be honest with you, I can't really do it because... I'm trying to get mine published, and right. he said, I'm going to be honest with you. He said, but take it to somebody. And somebody told me, well, Bob Clark handles some music. So I kind of shyly walked in there and said, well, i got a song. He wanted to hear it, and he said he had heard of me all his, all his life. And mm -hmm. he said, we just never met, but he was a lawyer in the same town there. And he said, well, let me see what I can do. So he said, he called me back and said, would you consider letting us write your life story in some moonshine script? Mm -hmm. I said, well, I don't know. And he said, well, I got a friend down in Georgia, Guy Waldron, that wants to write a moonshine script, and he don't have the color for it. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, go home and write this stuff up. And I said, man, I can't write all that stuff. He said, well, put it on tape. So I walked in there. I went home. I sat down at the table with a tape recorder. I talked all night long wow. and quit the next morning at 8 o'clock about old tales and stories. He said, man, I can see a 10-year TV series in these tapes. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. So we worked out a deal that they'd take it. And then Guy came up and stayed with me, and they wrote it into Moonrunners. Mm -hmm. And then they took Moonrunners after that. Guy wrote Moonrunners, and it, it done good for its time. And then he took the material I had left and a lot out of Moonrunners and went and wrote The Dukes of Hazard. Mm -hmm. And if I had an old race car, I drove on the road and then I'd haul whiskey on it on the weekend and drive it to church on Sunday. I guess oh, you wow. call it a business <laughs> coupe. <laughs> but, uh, and that's how it got started and mm -hmm. it just went, went from there and turned out to be one of the hottest TV shows. Absolutely, the, today, still today. Yeah, and it's one of the most famous cars in the world. Absolutely. I Absolutely. never dreamed of it, and then Larry took the old Chrysler I had, and he uh, t he bought it from somebody that restored it. That was the old car that I haul whiskey on, mm -hmm. and uh, he's got it now, and that's where he's doing a little film on that now. That car wow. we called it the Traveler after General Lee's horse. Oh gosh! <laughs> but we would always named her cars, and then we'd race them. You know, we had numbers on the doors and all that stuff. But of course, did your mother a lot live different. to see the Dukes of Hazard? No, no. Let's see. Wait a minute. Yeah, I guess she did. Do you think she understood the important part she played in this? Uh, no, she didn't. Because really you wrote like a song that. about your mama. 
Yeah. Who then you turned it in to turned it in to turned it in, and it just kept turning around, and then your life really did take a change. Yeah, she really didn't like for me to talk about it a whole uh -oh. lot, you know. But, <laughs> but uh, I had a brother, and see, it was kind of based off of me and my brother. Mm -hmm. And my brother, he got killed in a car wreck. Oh, wow. You know, he actually he had a heart attack and ran off the road and throwed him out, and the car turned over on him, and we lost him. Out of the characters of Dukes of Hazard, who are you the most like? Who do I like most? Who are you the most like? Uh, well, I was a little mixture of all of them, I guess. I was pretty rowdy. I wasn't that Surely good not. Boy, you know. Surely not. Uh, I used to like to fight pretty good when I was <laughs> young. But they kind of wrote John Spark after me because I raced and mm -hmm. right. did all that stuff and shot the bows and arrows. We Got on probation, had to hunt with bow and arrow and all that uh -huh. stuff. Uh -huh. Is there anybody in your life like Boss Hogg? Yeah, they sure was. He's dead now, but they wrote, actually, his name was Jay Lee, mm -hmm. and they called him Hogjaw, and that's where a guy got the name of J.D. Hogg. Oh, wow. And uh, Daisy was my first cousin. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And except she was more beautiful than the real one. Yeah, oh, she really? was a dream. Wow. Uh, she still lives down at Monroe. Oh. And uh, she was, uh, we wrote about her, and her daddy was my Uncle Worley. He was Uncle Jesse. Mm -hmm. He'd get about half lit, and then he'd get up preaching to all these old drunks <laughs> sitting around a table, you know. And, He'd say, you're going to hell if you don't quit drinking that liquor. And he'd beat on the table, you know. And uh, at, a lot of times I thought he was called to preach and just kind of resisted it. Because right. when he'd get drinking, he'd start preaching all the rest of them. Yeah. But we, Uncle Jesse was after him. And, of course, Boss Hogg was after Jay Lee. Mm -hmm. And uh, Enos was a uh, character was... Oh, I'm going to get killed for this. <laughs> Go ahead. Actually, Nobody's watching. <laughs> he was actually my brother-in-law. <laughs> he wanted to be a deputy sheriff so bad that he would uh, go get him a low holster like a cowboy, and he'd go up to the sheriff's department and ride around with him. And uh, he, uh, one day he was down on the river, and, you know, Enos is always saying, hold it, bing, yeah. and sitting there, well, where that came from? <laughs> He was down on the river, and they got bought him a pair of handcuffs, and he was down there, and he didn't know nobody was around the game more than slipped up on him just watching him. He'd, he'd say, all right, hold it right there, and he'd jerk that pistol out, and he'd say, if you move, I'll blow your brains out. And he'd go over like his handcuff in the tree, and that game warden sat there and watched him a little bit, and he said, about got it worked out, bub. And he said he jumped about that out. But they don't kill me for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody has a Barney Fife in their life, and everybody has an Enos, so and, now uh, we know who your Enos was. And uh, Cooter was wrote after Jim Hogan, his friend of mine, that he's dead now. About everybody's dying, mm -hmm. I mean, all the old ones. And uh, ever what me and my brother done, he looked at me like I was John Wayne. If I'd have told him, go over and shoot him, he's bothered me, he'd have went over and shot him. I mean, wow. he's just that way. Mm -hmm. He just kind of thought we were the only things on earth, you know, and he'd hang out with us and whatever we was going to do, he was going to go mm -hmm. on. I know I was going to talk him into wrecking a car when we was doing Moon Runners. And I said, Hope, why don't you run that? He said, boy, I wouldn't do that stunt for nothing. So somebody's going to get killed and they crash that car off in that creek. I said, you know, Hope, I said, you know, if you drove that car in that creek, you might get killed. But I said, people talk about that at Monroe for a long time. <laughs> a long time he said, I'm doing it. That's mine. I'm going to go tell a guy I want to do this stuff. <laughs> uh, now, let's talk a little bit about the driving. When you were driving and doing shine, there wasn't a lot of traffic in this area, was Not there? like it. No, there's too much traffic. Today now. it couldn't happen. No, I mean, it just no. And happen. we had a lot of dirt roads. Mm -hmm. And I was a terror on a dirt road. I wow. mean, there wasn't nobody in the world I thought could catch me on a dirt road. Were you ever, did you ever really put your life in jeopardy to a point that you got home and said, wow, I can't believe I made this? And, and ha did you ever think I'm stupid? Yeah. Yeah. 
but I was just crazy enough to do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think anybody could catch me in a car. And Did revenueers have a bounty kind of out on you, like because oh, they couldn't catch you? Oh, that was you? after me. They had, they followed me 44 nights with 21 cars. And one would get behind me and he'd tell me a while and I'd turn off and he'd go on another one pick me up the crossroad. They'd keep changing. I knew it was revenueers. And, but I would be going along and I'd turn off a road. Well, they'd go on. Well, I'd whoop off in a little old dirt road that went out to a field. And I might go five or ten miles through the woods and wow. come out on another highway. And then I'd meet one over there. They had their cars, 21 of them spread out. And they followed me 21 nights, and uh, they told them, said, you know, y'all going to have to drop it. It's costing too much money. Well, back then, all $100 was like 10000 now. Yeah. But uh, they said they'd done spent $150,000 and didn't have any results because I'd go, come out on another road and go through a, another patch of woods. I knew all those sawmill roads. and. I'd finally get a chance to dart in the road that went into the steel, and uh, they was going to have to quit the next day. And this, supposedly my friend got caught. And so he told me if they'd drop the charges, not give him no time, he'd tell them where that steel was at. Oh, my gosh. Are you and, still friends with him today? No, he's dead now. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> and uh, so they come in and caught my buddy at the steel, or I didn't catch him at the steel. We had went to the race night four because I had to race that night. Well, he always carried some moonshine. Well, that's rode up in the moon runners where mm -hmm. they'd take to the race and give mm -hmm. everybody a little shot. Right. Uh, at night, I went through the fence and broke my neck. And so they blowed the steel up that evening. That night, I had a bad crash. And... Uh, broke my neck and I woke up in the hospital in Lancaster, South Carolina and he was in the bed, next bed over and he had went to talk to a lawyer because it about busted that evening, they arrested him that evening mm -hmm. and uh, he got so upset he took a migraine headache so they had to take him to the hospital. <laughs> So that was really a bad day. That was a bad day. Was we a bad lost day. the steel. And a race car. Race car. Broke and about, a neck. About got killed. Yeah, that's that, that's not a good day. That is not a good day. That was a bad one. <laughs> that's a bad day. Now tell me about today. What is your life like today? Uh, I have mellowed out. Uh, not a wild and crazy man anymore. No, I don't no. fire off and do that crazy stuff. And I do a lot of talks at churches and places like that, and I travel some of the prison ministry to try to get some of the people, help them change their life and right. tell them what happened to me, and after I turned my life over to God and quit all this stuff, how wonderful things is, mm -hmm. and how great God has made it for mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. and uh, I've had several of them to write me back and say they read my book, and they would got saved, and uh, mm -hmm. they had quit all their stuff, and uh boy called me wanting to bring a little guy to see me this past week. And I told him to bring him on. And he said that he uh, wouldn't go to church and he wouldn't. Uh, they talked about how many hypocrites in church. And he said he told him, said, I agree with you, son. You're right. He said there's some good people there. And so he wanted to bring him over and let him t me tell him what all would happen to me. And he just worshiped the Dukes of Hazard. Mm -hmm. So that has hope a lot to get. A lot of people have changed their life over it. I get calls and stuff all the time where people mm -hmm. tell me, I decided if you could do it, I could do it. You really made Run into difference. one of my cousins that's had 25 years to go or something, maybe he got 25, <laughs> while I was doing the prison thing, and uh, he wrote me after that and told me he decided if I could change my life, he could, and said he got saved and he was uh, living right and quitting all this stuff. Mm -hmm. That really makes you feel good. But oh, yeah. No, I, I got away from all that crazy stuff. I moved up here, really, in one way, to get away from all of it because all my friends come by. And, mm -hmm. uh, one day, two of my old buddies come by. And, and one of them introduced me to John Gotti. And uh, he come by to see me, and he was talking about all these things that they were doing, you know. And 
when they left, she said, my daughter said, Daddy, I know you're not ever going to do anything else. Mm -hmm. She said, but you don't need to be around them boys. Right. I said, I know. She said, because when they get to talk of them con games, she said, I can see that little twinkle come mm -hmm. in your eye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and it will mm -hmm. if you don't watch it. Mm -hmm. But that's basically now I hunt, and I like to trap coyotes. That's one of my favorite things. People mm -hmm. get to eating their cats and their baby calves, and I do a lot of trapping on them. I, I love to do that. And I'm just kind of doing a laid-back life. And Well, I wish you'd have been in the motorhome with us when we turned in the road. Because we said, I said, did you tell him we're in a 40-foot motorhome? He said, yeah. I said, I don't believe the man hears well. <laughs> because I bet he thought you said a Ford truck. <laughs> I said, we can't take this motorhome down this road. Well, Duke's a hazard driver over here decided he could. Yeah. So we're coming down there and we get to your little bridge. And I said, you know, this thing weighs 30,000 pounds. Well, he gets out and walks over the bridge. And I'm thinking... How is he judging this? He weighs 205 and he's walking on a bridge and he's judging. It'll hold up a, a military tank. <laughs> it did. How did you choose this location? A friend of mine had some land up in here and he told me about it. and So I decided I'd get up here and look at it when I come up here. I just kind of fell in love with how the How many country. acres do you have? Oh gosh, I don't even know how many I got. I got about five miles like that way. Just... And from one road to the next. And, wow. And uh, it's a big spread in here. And I can get out there and ride a four-wheel around all day if I want to. And <laughs> I got deer and all kind of stuff in here. And every evening there's a lot of deer out here in the yard. And it's now, just the place for me. I, the hunting. All these all these animals. Are these things, are your, Are these your trophies? Yeah, they're on the, I got all this stuff on the hunt. Okay. Turkey. I see a big old turkey feather over there. Yeah. And I see uh, uh, that's got rams, a beautiful deer. deer. Yeah. Did that turkey come off this property? Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Now my daughter can carve a turkey head better than that wow. one up there. Really? Out of wood. Mm. She just beat the world champion in the contest. Oh, you're kidding. Oh, it took her day. She got a thousand dollars and uh, she had a mama squirrel carved in a hole in the stump. Uh -huh. with babies and everybody looked at it and said that's some good taxidermy work she said that's not taxidermy that's wood wow. I ain't no way that's wood and it at was. that point yeah. we've had a lot of interesting people where we had um, all the bombardiers from the coral sea come up here and uh, Fernando Leon from the Dominion Republic he had come up here and offered to let us stay in his uh uh, castles over it, uh, and uh, we had uh, the Golden Knights and a lot. All the Donald Trumps had men come down here one time. Mm -hmm. Blowed my mind. They all come here. <laughs> I bet you blew their mind too. <laughs> and they started unloading gambling equipment. I said, what are y'all doing? They said, Oh, we brought this along the place that we played back in New Jersey off of this. And oh uh, those boys were some characters. <laughs> One, uh, did they come to actually hunt? Yeah. Wow. Sure did. And now, how do people find out about you? Yeah, we are in most of. We used to be in all the magazines and on the internet. And uh, we there's not a country in the world we hadn't hunted somebody from. We've hunted from oh. Africa, Japan, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, Canada. You name it, and they've been somebody here. Wow. Now tell me, what would a guy, if, if a lady wants to give her husband one of your hunts for Christmas, what's it going to set her back? Well, if she wants to hunt like boar, we get $700 and we okay. furnish her. And that's per kill. Well, that's okay. guaranteed. Okay. And then they stay here at the lodge. There's no charge for that. And uh, we field dress their animals, skin them out, quarter them up and everything. My guides do that. Uh-huh. And uh, they, a lot of them do give them for Christmas. Mm -hmm. Christmas I started to say, $700 is reasonable for your yep. husband for Christmas. So that's very reasonable. Now, what's one of the more expensive? What what else do you do? Uh, buffalo and uh, stuff like that. And uh, we, we get some Ibex. We have all kind of stuff. Get stuff from everywhere. Wow. And uh, some uh, like big bull buffaloes. We uh, just shot a buffalo in uh, $3,500, but he weighed 2,500 pounds. And 
at steaks about twenty dollars a pound. So I was going to ask you, does all that meat get processed? Yeah, they they take all that meat back with them. Oh they process my it and eat gosh, twenty five hundred. That buffalo boy had to buy three freezers. To oh my lord! Out. And that's a thirty five hundred dollar hunt. Yeah, a big bull. Oh my goodness! Yeah, he was a monster. He's standing about seven and eight feet at the shoulders. Oh. Now, how did you get involved in the hunt thing? Did you just... I've always done that from a kid and just mm -hmm. wanted to do it. And I'd always dreamed about a place like this. And, mm -hmm. You know, I grew up farm boy. And we couldn't afford it. And then when I got older and I thought, well, this is what I'm going to do. And I made a little money off the Duke's of Hazard. Right. And got into movies, you know, and okay. started making a little bit of money. I said, I'm going to buy me some land while I can't afford it and I'm going to do what I want to. So I just... Right. So I bought it, and then I started working on it. Tell us about the other movies you've been in. Tell me some. Let's uh, see. Now, I was in The Night the Lights Went Out in Georgia with Dennis love Quaid. That. I love that movie. And uh, Moon Runners, uh, Dukes of Hazard, and Young Daniel Boone. I was a regular on the Young Daniel Boone show until it got canceled. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, gosh. Let me think of some of them. You, you know, I never think about these movie stuff, but I've been in probably the TVs, DVDs, and the different things about 60 all told. That's awesome. That is awesome. And uh, I've worked with John Houston down in Georgia on that, uh, what was it he done down there? I know he wouldn't have nobody for the part but me, so no, I want him. I don't know. Freddie, do you know? And, no. uh... uh Gosh, and we'll I was in out. Day of Judgment, Good Baby. Uh, gosh, what was it? Did you just take to it naturally? They didn't have to, because you just pretty much were yourself, or how did you do that? Yeah, I did. Did you step into a role? I'd get a role, and it was always somebody I knew, somebody like mm -hmm. that character, mm -hmm. and I'd just play them. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. And uh, Wise Blood, that was the name of that film Houston okay. did, yeah. But Earl Owensby, I've done some of his films, but he told me, he said, look, I'd give you $10,000, just let me go down there and play that part. Just to say, I've done a film with John Houston. Wow. And I said, well, what, what about John Houston? He said, he's just the most famous director in the world. Mm -hmm. He said, you know what that means? Say, he said, I'd give, pay you money <laughs> and give you what I made. And, I said, oh, well, I guess it was worthwhile. Yeah, so you've rubbed elbows with some pretty famous Oh, yeah, I've worked with yeah. uh, all Claude Aiken and all them. And about everyone, Ned Beatty and Warren Oates and the Mitchums. I stayed out at the Mitchums' house oh, for a while. I love Robert Mitchum. And uh, now Bob was a character. Oh, loved him, loved him. He, he uh, made, now I'm not a smoker, but he made smoking look like fun. You know? Jim does, too. Oh, Jim man. does smokes every time he does a movie. He yeah, smokes just yeah, like his yeah. daddy did. But Robert was a character now. He was incredible. And he'd ever look at you and cock his eye like that. You better step back about two <laughs> cells. He's fixing these. All them boys are expert fighters. Wow. I talked to his brother not long ago. I called his brother. Uh, we, me and John done several films together. We did a... Uh, Western out in New Mexico. Warren Oates come by to see us while I was out there. And Slim Pickens, I worked with Slim. Uh -huh. I worked with Slim on several shows. He is, a, he was a wonderful old guy. Wow. But you know, most of those old ones are dead. They are. They are. And uh, Slim really paid me a great compliment, though. He said, Jerry, he said, they've been looking for somebody to take my place when I'm gone. They can't find them. He said, and me and Arthur Honeycutt was just talking about it a little while ago. They was always all doing a film together. He said, you can do it. Wow. He said, I'm going to tell my agent. If you want to come out here and understand, uh, understudy me, he said, when I'm dead, you'll take my place. Mm -hmm. And she told me, she said, you come out here and I'll put you in every show that Slim's in uh, uh, to understudy him. Wow. And I told her, I said, I'd love to, but I can't live in California. Mm -hmm. I'm with you, Sunshine. She said, I cannot live in California. <laughs> I said, I can't do it. I'm a country boy. i got to go back home. This baby don't want to go to California. No way. See, I said, no, Daddy. As long as I'm riding, I don't much care. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, you know. Um, she rides on the four-wheeler everywhere I go. When we're hunting, she's right on the back. She wants to hunt. But I won't let her hunt no more. I'm nothing but squirrels because right here, 
under her she arm there. It was a boar got her, and he almost yeah. killed her, missed her lungs a half inch, and I said, you can't No more. That's it. That's I it. Said, I said, you got to stay on the floor and take care of Papa. <laughs> and she'll sit right there with me. Yeah. Now, do you have family that lives close by? Uh, my whole family does. Good, good. <laughs> my, me and my wife live at the top of the hill. My daughter and granddaughter lives down here. Okay. All right. So this is paradise. This oh, is yeah. Paradise. It's pretty yeah. much to yeah. me. My wife had rather live somewhere else, I think. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. But the drive in here was just incredible. So. And, you know, nobody bothers us. We know it's a, it's a good place to live. Mm -hmm. It is beautiful. Well, thank you so much for doing this. And well, I, I hope that welcome. folks will continue to watch the Dukes of Hazard. And now you know the gentleman that it's all about. And, and you know, you wouldn't have the General Lee and you wouldn't have the Daisy Dukes if it weren't for this man, Jerry Rushing. This is his life story, and I hope you will take a, a gander now. What's the name of your book? Uh, the Real Duke of Hazard. The Real Dukes of Hazard. Get a, get a copy of that and, and see how anybody can turn their life around. And I think that's something awesome that you now get out and share your story with folks. Oh, yeah. Check out his life story. Do you have a website? Uh, yeah. Tell me what you Jrushing.com. Jrushing.com. Uh, get to know a little bit more about this man. And, hey, ladies, here, I've done your Christmas shopping. Send him 700 bucks. Honey gets to come up here and go on a hunt, and you get three days of shopping. So doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> From North Georgia now today, we are leaving. We're leaving North Carolina, headed back to Georgia. We'll see you again Monday morning. I hope that little trip has encouraged you to get out today and do a daycation. We took a long daycation. We were actually out on the road two days that trip, but uh, get out today. It is beautiful. The air is crisp and it feels so good. It won't feel good in a couple of hours. It's going to get hot again. But get out and head up toward North Carolina. Head over toward Tennessee. Go up toward Turtletown. Go up toward the Nantahala. Get out and enjoy the bounty that God has given us. And if you are one of those churches that are still having revivals, you know, we love those old songs. We love those standards. We love those that tell the truth. And uh, if you're having a problem today trying to figure out where do you want to go in life, pick up the Bible and just open it up and say, there you go, and read one scripture and it'll tell you what direction to head in. I got a message today from Daryl. He always sends out Bible verses every day. And when I read today's, I said, wow, that is so appropriate for today. Every single day, there's an appropriate Bible verse for your day. So pick up the Bible, read you a Bible verse, listen to some great gospel music, and head out on the road and take yourself a daycation. Right now, we're going to take you to a little song by that man that y'all love. He's coming back. The masters are supposed to be done today. 
and we're working on a 90 minute special for Georgia Mountain Fair. It will include that music and I am super excited. Yay, finally, finally, finally. So sit back now and enjoy a little bit of those songs that made America great again. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a rich like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind. Then when 